Now, what, what we've already gotten into a little is uh, what happens when the mathematics we use to describe physical reality start kind of testing our ability to envision them in a way. Um, and that that has gone a lot further with modern physics, right? Where mm-hmm. you, you get something like quantum physics where the math continues to work, but mm-hmm. the reality it points to is pretty literally inconceivable, right? Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I'm the, the examples are familiar, the idea of the wave particle duality, like, uh, you know, an electron for some purposes, it seems to behave like a, uh, a particle for some purposes, like a wave. It seems that seems to depend to some extent on decisions you make about measuring it. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and what like what do you make of the seeming incomprehensibility of modern physics? Well, I, I think this this question of what Eugene Wigner famously called the unreasonable effectiveness in mathematics, uh, sorry, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, um, it is really one of the great philosophical questions of our time. You know, we know that the equations of general relativity have been tested to something like 15 decimal places, the equations of quantum mechanics, some of them have been shown to be correct to more than 20 decimal places of accuracy. So these theories are showing us deep and important facets of the way the world works. But they it's extremely difficult to know how to interpret them as models of physical reality, particularly with the quantum theories. And I mean, I think this presents us with a very big sociological, I think it, it presents us with several problems. One, is, one of which is a sociological problem, which is this. If we have a theory or description of the universe, which is, is the official description of our universe that's presented in places like the New York Times and in, on TV, and PBS programs, etc., but that description of the universe can't be understood by 99.99% of our population, then I think that's a problem because what do people do? If one of the functions of science is supposedly to make us feel at home in the cosmos, um, as Kaufman has suggested, and I agree with him that that should be one of the functions of science. This what is, happens this if... This is Stuart Kaufman? Stuart Kaufman, mm-hmm. yeah. What happens if the majority of people can't even begin to feel at home in that cosmos because they can't even begin to understand it. And I think I call this the cosmological problem. And and we're at that point now, and I think it's a pretty unusual point in history because, you know, it's almost as if our official picture of reality can only be understood by, you know, a few 10,000 people on Earth. Well, can it even be understood by them? I mean, Richard Feynman kind of famously said... In his book, I think the character of physical law. He said, "He said, you know, it used to be said that nobody could under there was a time when nobody could understand relativity." He said that was wrong. There was always somebody. Einstein really understood relativity. He said, "But it, but it is not the case that anyone truly understands quantum physics, right?" Yes. There, there's yes. a, in other words, it gets. Uh, I mean, there there are certain ideas in science that are so obscure that only a very a very small number of people understand them. But Feynman himself. Who won the Nobel Prize for insights into quantum yeah. physics said yeah. that he didn't. There was a sense yeah. in which he did not understand quantum physics. Yes, yeah. yes, and but but I think that there's a huge desire in the parts of many people to understand science. I don't actually buy the idea that we live in an anti-science world at all. I actually think we live in a world in which an awful lot of people want to understand science. Um, but there just aren't ways in for them. So I think we have a crisis in the representation of science, a crisis in science education, and a crisis in the public, uh, in the movement to engage people public in, publicly in science, which I think is really failing in a lot of ways. Now, can we, could we get to a point where everyone could understand quantum theory and general relativity? I'm not sure that we could. Um, and at least not beyond a certain point. I think there's a certain amount of it that we can explain. Um, 
but I think there is a problem that um, the theories, as you say, have become so difficult, and particularly when you look at the attempts to fuse them with things like string theory or loop quantum gravity. I mean, I think these theories really are beyond what most ordinary people could, people who don't have degrees in physics and mathematics, I mean. And so I think that, that we are presented with a difficult sociological problem. But I, I think that there's another problem, which is that if we look at the mathematical theories, as I said earlier, we know that they're correct to 10 or 20 decimal places. They are telling us powerful structural things about the underlying natures of reality. But is this a theory of everything? <laughs> and is it something which should be given that kind of status or even discussed in those words? And I would like to challenge that. Because I don't believe that no matter how much we understand about particle physics or even neurology, I don't believe that is going to make us understand, say, love or joy or fear or hate. Um, and I think that we're, we're entering a time where I think the, ex the claims about what can be explained through physical science, I think, are being somewhat inflated in a way that has some fairly problematic repercussions. Okay. I mean, uh, one thing about the, before we move into the issue you've just raised, I say one interesting thing about uh, the weirdness of quantum physics and to some extent relativity from a point of view of scientific literacy is the weirdness of it has an alluring effect. It, it actually gets people interested, <laughs> right? No, I mean, I find that when you talk about the weirdness of quantum physics, people pay attention. The weirdness intrigues them. And so that might be, you know, a feature more than a bug from the point of view of scientific education. I mean, of course, then you then you run into the problem that once you explain it to them, you, you can teach them a certain number of actual things. But there's a limit on the extent to which they can intuitively comprehend and visualize what is said yeah. to be going on. Right. I mean, I, th I think you're right that, that for certain people, the weirdness of quantum mechanics is, as you say, a feature, not a bug. I think that's true for some people. I think a lot of people just find it off-putting. Hmm. I, I think there's a lot of other people who, who just throw up their hands and say, well, you know, I can't, I can't understand that. I mean, one of the reasons I started writing my own books about the history of physics was because I, I kept having the following experience. Um, most of my, although I studied physics and maths at university, most of my friends are in the arts. They went to art school. Um, and people would keep coming up to me at parties and saying, you know, Margaret, I bought a brief history of time and I couldn't get past chapter one. Tell me a book about physics that I could actually understand. And I kept hearing this and I couldn't really recommend anything because most of the books that the physicists write are really not comprehensible to mm -hmm. someone who hasn't really done a lot of serious reading already. So I thought I would try to write a book. And in doing my first book, it's a, it was an attempt to make sense of what physicists say about the nature of reality by putting it into cultural context and historical context. How did we get to this point? Why were they asking the questions? What was at stake when you ask a question like, is the sun or the earth at the center of the cosmos? And many, many times I hear people say, oh, I tried to read Brian Greene's book and I couldn't make head or tail of it, I've concluded that I just don't have the right kind of mind for science. Now, that's a tragedy. Your ability to do or not do science should not be measured, or your inadequacy in science should not be signaled by the fact that you can't understand 